I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled DOD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted except for the presenters. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a couple days. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd briefly like to mention our next webinar. It will be on the Air Force Research Laboratory's new Open Innovation Campus Initiative. And that will be briefed by the Chief Engineer of the Information Directorate on 19 September. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. It's my great pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Nick Nicholas Shalom. He's a member of the Senior Executive Service and was appointed as the first Air Force Chief Software Officer. Nicholas serves as the co-lead for the DOD uh, Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative with the Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. As the Air Force's senior software czar, Nicholas is responsible for enabling programs in the transition to agile and DevSecOps capabilities and best practices, including continuous authority to operate processes and faster technology adoption. The CSO also works with the program executive officers in analyzing current software and cloud migration plans while allowing for rapid prototyping and a streamlined process for deployment. I will now turn the presentation over to uh, Mr. Shalom. Good afternoon, Nicholas. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, excited to be here and be, being able to share uh, what we've been working on now for about a year uh, when I started uh, literally August 15, 2018 at uh, the DoD, uh, initially with OSD and now with the Air Force. Uh, and really, this is uh, growing really fast and, and it's getting very exciting for everybody. So we'll go over uh, some of the key concepts around the DoD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative. And uh, we actually just released yesterday a reference design uh, architecture for DevSecOps with a, a DOD-wide um, continuous ATO process, uh, well well detailed, and it's it's a document that's uh, being released publicly in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but if anyone wants to get access to the the document, they can shoot me an email. We'll we'll show the slide later that has my my email. So if they need a copy of the reference design architecture, feel free to uh, to reach out to me. But we're going to move to the next slide. Okay, so just to go equipment. over, yep, program statement, perfect. Um, so just to go over the uh, the problem statement, uh, DevOps is nine years old, Agile started 19 years ago. Unfortunately for, for the department, we still have issues implementing uh, the basic principle of Agile, both in terms of contracting and also in terms of software development. And so really DevSecOps, is the evolution of Agile bringing automation and insisting on automated testing, automated security, and really helps remove impediments when it comes to uh, the authority to operate process, the ATO process for DoD, and uh, brings uh, kind of this uh, baked-in uh, security when it comes to uh, DevSecOps. So the SEC side of DevOps DevSecOps is not about just doing some static dynamic uh, co-analysis on your source code. That's just DevOps. Uh, 
um, that SecOps is all about the continuous monitoring side of the house. So you'll see what we bring to the table here with uh, a zero trust model uh, down to the container level. Uh, you'll see that we we massively use containers uh, across the stack. Uh, but really, you know, why we care is because, of course, uh, software is part of every uh, aspect of the DoD's mission, whether it's uh, business systems or weapon system or cyber offense, defense, or AI. Cyber is a cri critical component that has to be uh, decoupled uh, from the hardware and being able to update software fast and rapidly uh, and knowing that you're not going to break things by doing so is, is critical. And uh, it's kind of the key principle behind uh, this initiative. And really, uh, we want to make sure we uh, we are not behind China and Russia when it comes to uh, DevSecOps. And so uh, a massive push has been made by OSD, DoD CIO, uh, ANS, and all the services to, to adopt uh, DevSecOps. And so we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like. Next slide, please. So really the move we're, we're making in the department is moving from waterfall still to DevSecOps. And so when you look at the, the different aspects, first, of course, we're moving from uh, waterfall to agile to DevOps, DevSecOps. <laughs> then we also move from a monolithic application. So they, you know, this massive piece of software that we can now cut into microservices and uh, allowing us to have this kind of uh, smaller code base and modular approach where you can swap uh, microservices and allow for reuse of code. And then of course you have the uh, physical um, server moving to uh, virtual machines and now containers uh, for people that know about uh, functions uh, and serverless, we also uh, have a serverless stack uh, as well uh, on top of, of the container stack we, we bring as well. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, K-Native and uh, uh, what we're doing with functions. <laughs> and, and then you have, of course, the hosted uh, to data center to cloud. So when we, we say cloud, we don't mean just uh, uh, the traditional clouds. Of course, we have government clouds, but we also bring hardware on premise and at the edge uh, with compute and storage. But also the key component is not just bringing virtualization anymore. It's really all the APIs and automation we need uh, to be able to have a real cloud. Um, and so already we have options today uh, in the DoD to uh, bring hardware with a full cloud stack uh, on top of it and bring um, DevSecOps at the edge or um, on bases or classified or disconnected environments as well. <laughs> so we'll talk about that as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So really, what is this uh, DevSecOps initiative? Uh, first, it's a joint program. I'm the co-lead with DoD CIO. Um, so that involves ANS, uh, DoD CIO, the Air Force, DISA, and all the services. Uh, the first aspect is really on the technical side. We really didn't want to be locked in to any uh, cloud provider or any platform. So we don't want to be locked in to Pivotal or Red Hat or anybody else. And so we picked Kubernetes, which is open source and uh, was initially created by Google, but is now part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, uh, CNCF. And the Air Force is actually the, the first member of the US government of, of CNCF. Um, and so uh, we wanted to make sure we would be abstracted from the platform and from the cloud provider um, so we don't get locked in. Uh, a big principle of DevSecOps is infrastructure as code, and that means everything you do is code. Uh, you don't actually connect to uh, production systems and, and change things while it's running. You go back to code and redeploy uh, your production stack, and that ensures you know uh, that you're not drifting between dev uh, testing and staging and, and production environments. And so, a big aspect of that is. Everything is code, your networking is code, your cyber is code, uh, your stack, your entire stack is really code. 
And so if your code is going to be using uh, a tool uh, to uh, deploy it, uh, you're going to be uh, locked in potentially to that tool. And so Kubernetes uh, abstracts that by letting you uh, talk to Kubernetes and then based on where Kubernetes is deployed, you can then, uh, the Kubernetes will, will talk to the APIs of, of cloud and uh, make sure that you don't get locked into a cloud provider and you know that uh, uh, any Kubernetes compliant uh, product, whether it's uh, Pivotal PKS, uh, VMware Central PKS, uh, OpenShift, uh, Red Hat, or uh, Amazon uh, AKS, uh, EKS, or Azure AKS, all of these products will be compatible and your code will run the same uh, regardless as, as far as what product you end up using. And so that gives us an abstraction to the cloud and to the platform. So the, the key aspect is one, no lock-in. Two, uh, make sure that uh, the stack will run the same no matter where we are. If it's a cloud, if it's a, a, a disconnected environment, if it's a classified environment. <laughs> and so Kubernetes was a great fit for that. And of course, containers. Uh, so we're moving to uh, an entirely containerized uh, stack with all the tools, including the, the tools that we use to build the DevSecOps pipelines, the continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, CA, CD, uh, pipelines are all entirely uh, containerized as well. And so that gives us the ability to instantiate uh, a software factory, a DevSecOps stack <laughs> with a push of a button on any environment. So very important. <laughs> so the first aspect was selecting about 170 tools, uh, databases, you know, 16 programming languages, um, build tools, test suites, and, and cybersecurity tools, and so on and have them uh, accredited DOD-wide uh, with containers. Uh, and so everything is containerized. And so we have this central repository of, of containers, uh, which is publicly accessible. It's on the internet. And it's also replicated to classified environments. And people can just use the containers as Lego blocks to instantiate their DevSecOps stacks, but also to build their mission application as well. So instead of uh, deploying Jenkins or deploying SonarCube or Fortify or GitHub, GitLab as a virtual machine and having to deal with the ETA of that, you can simply use the container and uh, benefit from reciprocity of that ETA. Uh, so that's the first aspect is really that central place where we update and maintain containers and so you don't have to maintain patch update uh, any of these containers. We update them. Uh, we provide the base OS digs. So any vendor that needs to provide a container back to us can use the, the container uh, that we have already stigged and approve uh, with UBI, universal base image, which is a RHEL image that does not require license. So anyone can use it and distribute it back to us and not infringe, infringe any license. Uh, so that gives us really the ability to, um, to deploy containers at scale. And of course, people can still pay and buy the licenses. Uh, we are also setting up a, a new IDIQ to buy licenses in bulk and services as well uh, in bulk across DoD. But in the meantime, programs can just pay the licenses uh, using existing or, or new uh, contract vehicles and use the containers so they don't have to uh, accredit any of that and maintain uh, the containers as well. Uh, the second aspect of the critical piece of DevSecOps is the runtime uh, uh, cybersecurity stack we're bringing, which kind of uh, uh, bring a zero trust uh, stack down to the container level um, bring as well behavioral detection, not just CV scanning. And so that's a, the SciCall Container Security Stack, SCSS, uh, which is uh, baked in into Kubernetes and automatically injected. So SciCall is just a smaller container running alongside every container. And so we know it's going to be there regardless if the developer thought about running it. It's automatically injected across the stack 
And because it's running alongside and not inside the container, unlike a, a VM with an agent, if the VM is compromised, the first thing they do is tamper with the logs and your agent is useless. In this case, because it's running alongside the container, we'll still get visibility in real time of what's happening inside the container. And so we can detect bad actor or behavior that's not uh, in line with, with uh, the, the detection we've done before and prevent you know, things from happening. And so it's really a more advanced behavior AI based uh, detection and it's automatically injected so we know it's going to be there regardless if the developer thought about you know running it. Our sidecar container also brings uh, zero trust so you have to whitelist two containers to talk to each other. You also have to uh, um, uh, use the, the sidecar to be able to automatically create uh, a mutual TLS tunnel between two containers so uh, no more issue of encryption uh, the sidecar container will do that automatically. So even if two developers build two containers that don't use encryption, I don't care because my sidecar stack will hijack the IP table and create a mutual TLS tunnel uh, between the two containers. So we have encryption for free across all the, the containers and we have uh, strong identities with certificates automatically created by the sidecar stack. And uh, so we get um, the ability to do whitelisting and zero trust down to the container level. So that's also something we bring uh, turnkey on the repo so people can just use SCSS to be able to get that for uh, baked in into their, uh, their software factory as well. Uh, what we're pushing as well on top of that is the uh, uh, microservice architecture with a service mesh. So the service mesh is really the east and west traffic between your containers, your microservices, all that communication between uh, two containers. So we uh, we picked Istio, ISTIO, which is open source as well, to do east and west uh, traffic, um, load balancing, uh, zero trust, and all that. So that's uh, baked in, and so we help teams move from a monolithic application to microservices. Um, so that's uh, that's baked in into the stack as well, and of course we designed uh, a continuous ATO process um, that will be uh, available across DoD, so complete reciprocity across the department, so anyone can use uh, the stack and follow the guidance in terms of uh, test coverage, uh, automated testing, and cybersecurity findings uh, requirements, and benefit from a continuous ATO on the factory itself, and then a every piece of software coming out of the factory as well. So the software you build using the factory is also covered by the continuous ATO, assuming you use Kubernetes and containers as well <laughs> to build the software. Um, so that's the uh, the stack here um, is really kind of this uh, uh, DevSecOps pipeline with a push of a button instantiation and then um, hardened containers um, already approved by DoD, uh, microservice uh, architecture, defined thresholds to pass test coverage, uh, security scanning uh, to enable the continuous ATO, and then uh, of course Kubernetes to be abstracted. We're gonna go to the next slide. So one thing we're launching as well in the Air Force is uh, uh, it's a cloud uh, called Cloud One, like Air Force One, the Cloud One. Uh, two two cloud providers behind it: uh, Azure uh, Government and Amazon the Gov Cloud. Um, and so we have access to Impact Level Two, Four, Five, and and Six in the next uh, 45 days. Uh, so right now you can instantiate a, a DevSecOps stack. Uh, inside your own enclave uh, with a push of a button and we, we set it up for you. We get you uh, the all the, the cyber requirements, the ETO of the cloud, the CSSP, the cybersecurity services, and it's as easy as me pouring money to the Air Force Cloud One team and they can instantiate and you just pay your compute and, and storage um, and you can just use the cloud and deploy your containers on top um, of course, you still have to ATO any 
any VM or any stack you bring on top of that. If you use our uh, factory uh, and the containers, you don't have to worry about that. But if, if you bring your own stack, you, you have to do that. Um, so we bring, of course, turn, turnkey, single sign-on, and CAC authentication, all that baked in. Uh, all the cyber stack required by DoD CIO is, is baked in as well. Uh, and uh, we are working on this uh, multi-award IDIQ contract to buy licenses, services, and uh, cloud, cloud uh, all with the same uh, contract action as well. Next slide, please. So Level Up is um, the new central place where we are building factories for the Air Force, and many other services are using the same team to help them instantiate a factory, whether it's on the cloud or on the disconnected environment or, or whatever. Um, really, we realized we had dozens of teams in the Air Force building factories just so they could just build their software. And so we thought it was a waste of time. People should just focus on building software. Uh, that's what they are supposed to be doing. And so we uh, have a central team now help on Cloud One and on disconnected or classified environment uh, to to instantiate and deploy a software factory. So uh, it's as easy, as, again, as me bringing money uh, to get the talent, DevSecOps engineers, container hardening guys to uh, to help uh, deploy uh, a custom factory. And it's as easy as, as swapping containers and uh, like a Lego block kind of thing where you can just swap, you know, uh, maybe you want to swap GitHub for GitLab and, you know, Jenkins for GitLab or, or the other way around, or you want SonarCube and not Fortify, or you want checkmarks, <laughs> doesn't matter. We have uh, many options for every bucket, and so you get to pick what containers you want to use, and we just instantiate it, ATO the stack uh, with the continuous ATO, and uh, deploy it on Cloud One and uh, you just get to pay your compute and storage and license. Um, and that's just a, a, a fast uh, fast process uh, to deploy a, a custom kind of factory. Um, we have existing exemplars as well. So if people just want to reuse an existing factory, they can do that as well. And of course, that's uh, the same team that uh, provides uh, the DoD hardened containers, DoD-wide is inside that, that team. And so we centrally accredit and uh, maintain containers DOD wide. Um, that's part of the, the same team. Uh, additionally, that, that team is going to be providing um, managed enterprise services, uh, kind of a DA2 on steroids, um, if you know what DA2 is. Um, so we're going to have things like you know GitHub, GitLab, um, you know uh, DevSecOps as a service. Um, we're going to have uh, Sonar Q45, uh, 45 Checkmark. Um, we're going to have um, a Nexus Lifecycle, uh, Black Duck. We're going to have Nexus, Nexus uh, Repo, and Artifactory. Um, uh, we're going to have Chats, Mattermost, and Rocket Chat, things like that as a, as a managed service so people can pick always two options because there's not a one-size-fits-all in, in DevSecOps, so we, we have always two options at least, if not three. But those are managed services where you just co-pay for uh, use uh, per user or per CPU, depending on the, on the product. And uh, we maintain it, we run it, you just pay uh, to use it. That's hosted by us. Um, and so, um, well, you move slides, so that's good. Uh, the, that's a good example of, of a DevSecOps uh, pipeline uh, where we show how to move from plan to develop to build to test to secure all the way to uh, monitoring and deployment and again that's just an example um, all the tools are containerized and that's very important um, we don't have VMs running and you just get to pick you know what uh, what tools you want to use that's just an example here uh, you can swap containers and, and just pick another tool. Uh, if the tool you want to use is not already approved by DoD, by my team, you can uh, follow the container hardening guide, 
Um, we also have a community of practice with about 600 uh, users now in DoD. Um, so you feel free to join and shoot us an email uh, to join the community of practice. Um, but there is also access on that website uh, to um, get the, the container hardening guide. So if you have your own container, you need to get approved. And it's a product that uh, could benefit uh, the rest of the department. And you don't want to wait for us to uh, to harden it. You can do that proactively, give it to us. And we accredit it and maintain it for the department. Uh, that's assuming it's, it's a product that can benefit the, the rest of the department, of course. Um, now, that's a good example of uh, the architecture. And please wait for me to see the next slide. Um, that's the... Gray box here is your uh, architecture. Uh, that's your cloud. That's your uh, on-premise or disconnected or classified uh, environment. Uh, the blue box on the top right corner is my repo. It's on Gov Cloud L2, so it's publicly accessible to the internet. But we also replicate that on <laughs> on CPON and JWX. Um, and you can go back to to the next slide, the architecture slide. <laughs> yep. So that's the blue box on the right. The uh, orange box is your repo uh, in your environment that's replicated. And so you, you get uh, the copy of all my containers into, into your environment this way. Um, we use a cycle stack to centralize logs. And so we use FluentD and Elasticsearch uh, to centralize logs. Uh, that is then pulled by the service CIO or the I'll this our cyber command to get uh, global visibility on what's going on. Um, and then the entire stack is, of course, based on Kubernetes. And you can, of course, pick a product if you're going to use a PKS or OpenShift or something else. Uh, you can do that. And then you have your, your code on top of that. Uh, so that's kind of a, a simple example. Your source code repo could also be inside the gray box running as a container. And so that's that's optional. You, you decide what you want to do there. But many teams have GitHub or GitLab or, or something else uh, running inside the Kubernetes cluster as well. So go to the next slide, please. So very important for us when we scale to microservices. And of course, we have multiple programming languages, uh, 16 programming languages we're supporting. And that is. Um, uh, very important uh, to enable teams to pick the right tool to get the job done. And so um, uh, people realize that when they use different programming languages, they have to manage libraries uh, to do authentication, encryption, and a lot of different things, logging. And, and that becomes uh, really uh, something that's going to slow down the team and, and couple them. And we want teams that are decoupled so they can uh, – uh, work uh, independently, and so we're pushing for a service mesh uh, to uh, to uh, avoid having to maintain dozens of libraries per, per programming language. And so the service mesh runs as a sidecar container, and is going to be able to uh, to do all all of that stuff uh, without having to run a library per programming language. And so um, we can. Um, Manage, you know, uh, API management, service discovery, uh, A/B testing, uh, so all advanced layer uh, three, four, seven load balancing. Uh, we enforce zero trust, east and west traffic with uh, the service mesh. So you have to whitelist containers so they can talk to each other. Um, we have a mutual TLS tunnel uh, by default with uh, strong identities with certificates uh, per uh, container. All that is um, free thanks to the uh, microservice architecture with Istio. Um, so we highly recommend for all the teams moving to microservices that they use a service mesh. Um, very important for, for scale and uh, avoid uh, locking to uh, specific products. Next slide, please. One more. So that's, we have four slides of tools. I'm not going to go over all the tools, of course, but um, just to show you, we're covering a lot of different tools from the source code repos to uh, 16 programming languages, 23 databases, including rational database, big data, NoSQL, 
time database, graph databases, uh, artifact repo, API gateways. Next slide, please. Uh, message buses like Kafka, proxies, visualization tools, logs, uh, aggregation tools, uh, web servers. Uh, for the base OS, we use Universal Base Image, which is RHEL, uh, which does not require a license, so that's what we picked. Uh, so we get the, uh, the trusted supply chain of the RPMs uh, of RHEL, but you're not infringing the license if you don't have a license of RHEL. So it's kind of the best of both uh, worlds. For serverless and functions, we use Knative, so we don't use Lambda, so we don't get locked into Amazon. Um, we use Knative, so it's abstracted to the cloud provider. Um, and then next slide. We have build tools and test suites, uh, test coverage tools. Uh, as you can see, many options for test suites. Test coverage is very important. You have to demonstrate you have enough enough uh, test coverage for your code. So, so both unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing uh, is kind of mandated as part of the the continuous ATO process. So, uh, based on whether you have a business system or weapon system, you could you could see things like uh, uh, a business system could be you know 70, 75 percent test coverage, uh, but a weapon system might be you know 85 to 95 percent based on uh, the authorizing official. So very important that we have a test coverage tool to demonstrate you're compliant with the requirements, um, but you can pick the one you want to use. Uh, of course, we have uh, many uh, security tools, both the, the basics, application security tools, static dynamic analysis tools. Uh, container security is very important. We use TwistLock and Onco, uh, which are two products for containers. Uh, you may know that ACAS and HBSS are not able to see what's going on inside of containers. So you might be compliant, but you're not secure. So we use container security tools for containers. Um, we have tools for the, the STIG compliance, for uh, 508 compliance, um, build of material tools like Black Duck, Nexus Lifecycle. Um, so many, many, many options out there. Uh, many uh, open source tools. And of course, uh, we centrally update uh, containers and so if it's an open source tool, um, we we do the, the scanning and uh, we check for security uh, of these tools uh, within my team. And then we, we provide it as a container. If it's a commercial tool, we, we do the same through the vendor that provides the, the tool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have multiple monitoring tools and Collaboration tool, chats, planning tools like Jira, Confluence, and all that. Uh, secrets um, to store the the keys and the passwords. Very important. Don't store that in your source code, or um, make sure you you encrypt that with secrets. We also have a container uh, to do single sign-on across the stack using Keycloak, which is open source. Uh, that enables us to do SAML, OpenID, and OAuth, and uh, allows us to do multi-factor authentication, but also CAC authentication as well. So you could run that container as a sidecar container alongside any container that does not support CAC authentication. And now it's acting as a reverse proxy and will be able to do authentication for you uh, free. Uh, so you get a single sign-on across the stack. Uh, so you can run it as a microservice inside your application, and then you get uh, the ability to do single sign-on in your app, or you can run it as a sidecar container alongside another container, and you get single sign-on again for free, uh, including CAC authentication. And of course, we have all the documentation tools and performance tools as well. Next slide, please. So um, a lot of people ask us, how do you move from legacy to, uh, to DevSecOps? And there is only one answer. Uh, the answer is using the strangler pattern. And the, the, the process is quite simple, but still uh, very misunderstood. The key aspect of the strangler pattern is to uh, allow for the complete um, rewrite of the legacy while, and the key is that aspect, while uh, enabling the team to bring new uh, features and, and 
prioritize uh, based on the end user feedback and do it in a in an agile fashion so i'm going to give a little example here uh, and i'm going to take something simple like an e-commerce application just to keep it simple but we are doing this right now with weapon systems um so an e-commerce application because you would have uh, been to our great uh, training at DAU that we created um, on Agile and uh, how to cut monolithic application to microservices using domain-driven design and understanding uh, bonded contexts. And uh, because you understand uh, domain-driven design, you can look at your legacy and uh, let's assume it's an e-commerce application. You can now first create domains. So domains might be, you know, billing, uh, payment, user, search, uh, product, right? And so the first aspect is to put the, the legacy to the side. You never touch it again unless uh, for security updates. And if you start cheating the, the process, it's not going to work. But uh, first, put it to the side. Don't touch it. Put a service mesh in front. So it's kind of an API gateway initially. All it does, it, it redirects to the legacy app and does nothing else. Now, based on your customer feedback, one of the number one feature being asked is, for example, to provide recommendations after you buy a product on what to buy next. And so you look at it and you think, okay, that's going to impact my product detail page, which is a microservice inside my product uh, body context. And because you went to the training and you uh, heard about uh, the two pizza rule, which is about uh, the size of your team, so how much you need to feed that team two pizzas. So depending of uh, who is on the team, though, if it's me, you might not have less people because I eat a lot of pizza. But uh, let's say two pizzas, <laughs> you're going to be able to size that team. And the first thing you're going to do is rewrite the product detail page, which is maybe a two to three weeks uh, work. Um, so you do that. Maybe you have the same team or a different team also build the recommendation microservice, which will list the five products to buy when you uh, bought something else. And of course, because one is using some AI capability, maybe using Python and Elasticsearch or Hadoop on that one versus the other stuff is maybe you know Java and MySQL, who knows. And um, you have the service mesh, so the service mesh will now, for these two pages, redirect to uh, the new microservices and the rest will still point to the legacy and you keep doing that and the key is to prioritize uh, Prioritize the, 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 the changes based on the feedback of the end users and not just you waking up and picking What feature you're going to do next and not just rewriting exactly the same thing, right? If you spend three years to simply refactor code That's not what the standard pattern is, right? That's just why we fail in the government to modernize programs because we just spent three years rewriting exactly the same thing. And that's not the goal. The goal is to deliver rapidly. So thanks to the CI/CD pipeline, you can deploy the two microservices you just built the same day. Um, you have that online. You have the service mesh abstracting the legacy. Um, so it's, it looks like the same thing. Uh, but at the same time, you just delivered new capabilities um, while refactoring a piece of the legacy, right? And you're going to slowly do that again and again until there is no legacy left and you turn it off. Even if it takes years for the legacy to be gone or even if there is always a piece of the legacy still up and running, it doesn't really matter because you prioritize your your needs based on uh, the, the, the priorities of your end users and that could be also security uh, uh, needs that you have to uh, prioritize as well. But slowly but surely, you rewrote the code, and now you're in a DevSecOps, continuous ATO kind of mode, so you can deliver the code rapidly and uh, and do that at scale. So I'm going to stop here, and I see there's a lot of questions. Uh, um, I don't know if you want to ask me the questions, or should I just read the questions? Uh, well, if if you want to, uh, yeah, if you want to uh, read the question, and, and it's uh, I wasn't I wasn't sure if you could see the questions yourself or not, but if you yeah, want I can to, see, I can see the questions. <laughs> yeah, you've got okay. So yeah. Now, if you want, 
Yeah, read the question. Yeah, so that every everybody can hear them, and uh, so so uh, y yeah, if you can you know, pick and pick and choose from the list because I think you did, uh, like you said, it was a uh, very very popular topic. So uh, pick pick and choose the the ones you'd like to uh, to field there. Yeah, if you can go to the next slide, I just want people to have. I think the next slide should be my my email. Oh no! So let's let's just talk about this quickly too. Uh, there's a self-learning slide. You have three slides on my on my slide deck uh, that have videos um, uh, for different levels of Kubernetes, Service Mesh, microservices. And so, if you want to learn and you're struggling with your team to understand what I'm talking about between my French accent and between the the complexity of the tech. These videos that can help you. So feel free to go through the videos, and you have different levels for each topic uh, on service mesh, microservices, and, and all that. So um, of course we'll share the deck. If you don't have it, you can send me an email. But there should be a slide uh, that has my email uh, that says something like "Thank you." Uh, it might be all the way at the end, so you might have just to swap all the way to the last slide. But in the meantime, I'm just going to answer the questions. <laughs> um, so why are containers the next evolution of deployment and packaging after virtualization? Uh, well, I think it's just because uh, it's actually something that's replicable and immutable, and we treat containers as cattle, not like pets. So the issue with VMs is you gave a name to the uh, VMs, and you care about them. You don't want them to go down. With containers, we don't care. We actually kill containers every four hours, so if a bad actor get a foothold on the containers, we just uh, kill it every files anyway, and it goes back to a known state. So you, you should not actually make changes inside the container. You should always make the change to the code, which will rebuild the container. So containers are immutable, and that's a good way to uh, abstract and ship the software so you know it's going to run the same way. Um, so it's kind of a, a gold disk concept, if you will. Uh, but down to a smaller uh, size and easier way to replicate. Um, so a lot of questions about the, the PDF and slides, so we'll, we'll send the slides to everybody. Um, so uh, is a container acting as a type ATO? It's a little bit more complex than that because containers are just Lego blocks. Uh, you need Kubernetes running as a stack uh, to run the cycle container stack to be able to have that continuity to your reciprocity. So it's not just using the container on bare metal. You also need the Kubernetes uh, orchestration stack. So it's kind of a whole thing. Uh, you have to have a Kubernetes compliant stack. You have to have the sidecar container stack, and you have to use the accredited containers. So each container, ha you know, they, they come with uh, documentation on the findings and full documentation uh, on why, you know, they passed accreditation for that one block. But it doesn't mean you can just use it as is with nothing else. So that's why we designed this reference design architecture document I talked about. That's going to be released uh, in days. Um, it's already available to all the dot mail uh, emails. So shoot me an email, I can send it to you. Um, and that has uh, kind of the full uh, detail on what has to be there to be able to get a, a country ATO DoD wide for DevSecOps. Um, how is runtime security testing being conducted in this model? Um, so we have uh, uh, the cycle stack running that brings our runtime uh, scanning. So we have multiple tools in that, um, including TwistLock, which will be able to do uh, CV scanning and uh, behavioral detection as well. We have the zero trust stack that will prevent and reduce attack surface by limiting what containers can talk to what. Um, and um, we have, uh, of course, um, that behavior uh, that will prevent uh, a container from doing something it's never done before, uh, either alerting or, or preventing. We have both options. Um, so a lot of, lot of baked in security from, from day one. Uh, containers self-update. So Anytime there is an update of my containers, uh, they kill every four hours and will restart either from uh, the new update, if there is a new update, and if there is no new update, just restarts from the previous non-state. So harder for a bad actor to uh, uh, laterally move, of course, at the same time. Um, 
what is uh, being used to test east-west security of microservices pre-deployment. So that's part of the cycle stack as well. Uh, right now, we uh, mostly use uh, Twistlock, Aqua, and um, Encore to do that. Um, and probably going to have more options, but he's doing uh, a good job today. Um, So uh, the time issue, so how is the time uh, determinism assured for weapon systems dependent upon specific uh, latency? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we are actually working on that with uh, Aegis in the Navy, NF-16, NF-35, and other programs. Um, so first I have to say that a, a tiny piece of the weapon systems is time sensitive, and so we have to treat it this way. That shouldn't be the whole stack, you know. Uh, thanks to microservices, you can put that to the side. And sometimes, yes, you're not going to run that using containers, and that's okay. Uh, that becomes part of the uh, the existing uh, ATA of the weapon system, and you can just cut that out and leave it as is. Um, but then the new, um, like the UI or, or new features that are not uh, time uh, dependent, might be using um, containers. And, and we're working on, on solving the problem uh, as well uh, using, um, using containers as well. Um, the documentation, yes, there's the documentation. Um, that's the reference design um, that I just talked about. So, so shoot me an email. I can send it to any .mail email. It's going to be publicly released pretty soon. Um, security features prevent me from seeing the slides. I know that's the beauty of DoD. And you're prevented from seeing the good stuff as well. I'm sorry um, for the list of uh, MATLAB. We actually have a whole team, so we're working with uh, the Joint AI Center and Unify Platform to bring uh, Kubeflow, uh, which is running on top of Kubernetes, which is AI, machine learning, deep learning tools with uh, 50 plus tools. That includes stuff like TensorFlow, uh, Spark, Hadoop, um, Jupyter Notebook, Hub, uh, MATLAB, and, and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, we are still working through the funding to uh, harden all these containers. Um, we have a couple of programs that need to do it, and so we're trying to do it centrally for everybody else. So I, I think it's going to look good for us to do this in, in the next uh, a uh, couple of months. It's going to take us probably six months to accredit all of the tools, but we have teams already using uh, Kubeflow today on Kubernetes, and so you can still use it today and not wait uh, for the hardening, and that will allow you to use uh, R and MATLAB as well. Um, what else is there? How do you associate tests with requirements? Uh, that's a that's a very complex answer. Uh, I don't know if I can answer that here, but uh, you'll see we have uh, a lot of that information inside the reference design document I talked about. Um, how is open source software supply chain maintained in this model? Uh, you mentioned Black Duck as one of the tools. Uh, yes, so we when we harden containers, we use uh, what we call a, a container factory, which is really a CI/CD pipeline to scan all the containers and do a bit of materials of, of whatever we we get, whether it's a it's a cut, a commercial software, or an open source product, uh, we we scan regardless. Um, I think there is of course uh, uh, a lot of new things we could be doing on top of that as well. Uh, I think it's pretty strong compared to what DoD was doing before. So we do uh, a traditional, you know, uh, static dynamic analysis and, and container security scans using tools like Twistlock and Onco. And of course, um, the bit of material stuff will, will bring some value as well. Um, of course, there's always issues with zero days. So that's why we also have the, the runtime to detect any uh, zero day or runtime behavior that doesn't look good. So we don't just bet on the scanning side, right? It's just a piece of the whole, the whole process. Um, 
let's see. Uh, wow, this is a, a book. You wrote a book, Jacob. Uh, I can see the benefit in abstracting away many of the standard using RMS. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, will there be? Mm. Yeah, so each each program, first to answer the question, how will each uh, uh, team uh, will be responsible for their platform? So uh, as long as it's a Kubernetes platform um, and it's CNCF compliant, you, you can use it. We have exemplar and playbooks of staked uh, platforms already on my repo. So if you need to deploy something like OpenShift and uh, you just want to do with a push a button deploy, uh, you can just take my uh, my playbooks and and run that, and you get OpenShift stigged uh, on the cloud, for example. So that will ensure you that you're already compliant with the requirements, but you can also instantiate your own, and then uh, we help you uh, get the ATO of that. Ideally, we use infrastructure as code, so you can instantiate automatically your platform anywhere, and then we put it on the repo so everybody else can benefit from that so we don't have to reinvent the wheel 20 million times for each platform. Um, and then we help absolutely, you, you have a question, will there be any support for programs uh, at the AO level um, uh, to uh, uh, help move uh, to cloud-based uh, structure? Uh, yes, every time a program becomes a pathfinder, of the DevSecOps initiative, and we have 34 uh, programs right now uh, active. We have uh, 60 total moving to DevSecOps. So all the big weapon systems, business systems, cyber offense, defense, across all the services, including uh, DLA, SOCOM, Transcom, are moving to DevSecOps and working with us. Um, so we help. We go talk to uh, the AOs to. Uh, explain the, the zero trust stack and, and what we bring to the table with uh, real-time telemetry and logs and behavior and zero trust. Uh, so we do that and it will also help remove, remove any impediment to, to cloud as well. Um, uh, is there uh, estimated what to be enough? Is there enough talent? I guess uh, no, um, there's not. <laughs> uh, that's one of the big issues we're facing in terms of the talent pool. Unfortunately, we don't have enough uh, talent, whether uh, it is through partners or uh, the DIB or uh, government employees. Of course, we are building uh, different trainings. You've seen the, the videos. We want to build also a self-learning stack where people can just go watch videos, have a virtualized uh, stack so they can practice and play with the stuff uh, and learn at the same time. So it's not uh, videos in the vacuum. So we're working on that as well, but clearly there's, there's a massive talent gap and that's probably the number one problem. It's also probably why you you have a, a CSO that's a French guy, I guess, with a French accent. Um, can we add any other tool? Yes, you can add multiple tools for monitoring. We have a few listed already, but if you find a tool that's not listed, you can harden it yourself following the hardening guide, uh, and then we um, we accredit it for you, assuming it's it's a tool that can be used by multiple programs. The requirement is that three three programs uh, could benefit from it, and then we, we do it for the enterprise. Um, what was that recommended book? There's a whole slide on books. So there's multiple books and there's multiple videos, but there's one called that see as a table and Phoenix project, but there's multiple other options um, as well. Um, in fact, I'm standing up a chief software uh, officer website for the Air Force, and uh, we're gonna have a training section on that site where you're gonna find all the books and all that stuff uh, and the videos. Uh, there seems to be a lot of modularity when with selecting containers, yes. How does one manage the selection um, and the uh, majority? Yeah, so how do you select the, the containers? Uh, we have a session when you become a pathfinder. We help teams uh, picking the, the CICD tools they're going to need for their MVP, the minimal viable product for the factory. And so we work with you to help um, stand up your, your CICD pipeline and, and making sure the tools are going to be compatible. 
um, but that's what that's what we do. Um, logs versus metrics using Alco versus DEG. What's your opinion? I think uh, that's where we don't want to be too opinionated. We want to bring options, and the teams pick what's best for you to get your job done. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to talk to you to see what you're trying to achieve. But uh, uh, sadly, a lot of people use uh, SysDig. So uh, the key for us, though, is to get the ELK stack to be the source of truth for, for all logs uh, from Kubernetes, from the clouds. So everything is there. So we pull that from uh, ELK centrally. Um, and, and we again, we don't use ELK. We use EFK. Uh, FluentD instead of Logstash uh, because we have specific secret sauce with FluentD. Um, how will the deployment of this environment be handled? So one of the key aspects for us is to provide it as a GFE stack. Uh, so what we mean by that is it's a government furnished uh, enclave, so you get access to the cloud. It's a government enclave, and then certainly contractors can set up the stack or set up containers, but the goal is for the government to be controlling the enclave, so we have access to the source code, we have access to the tests, the cyber scans, everything is accessible. It doesn't mean you cannot also instantiate a DevSecOps pipeline inside of your contractor environment, but we recommend that contractor actually come and walk inside uh, walk inside the, the GFE uh, stack provided by, by us to you, um, and then you can maintain that and help sustain it. Uh, but the fact is it's, it's kind of a, a GFE, uh, GFE stack. Um, that's kind of the recommended uh, practice. Um, and I don't know if we're going to be able to do all the questions, but is Uh, Nicholas, did we lose you? Well, I'm not sure, folks. Uh, we may have lost Mr. Uh, Shalone. I don't hear him. Uh, I don't hear him on the line anymore. Um, the uh, if we have some questions that we didn't get to, uh, we will we will try to get in touch with. Uh, Mr. Shalone, and see if he can provide some additional answers uh, to the questions we 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 didn't uh, we didn't uh, get to. And I just would like to note that the uh, recording of the webinar will be posted on our website. Uh, the slides, just the briefing slides, will will be up there also. Um, so so those no. those will. Hi, Nick, Nicholas. Sorry, I got you? kicked out. <laughs> Yep, I got kicked okay. out of the conference. I think everybody else was kicked out too because there's only one uh, attendee now. So, oh well, uh, we I, I I still see I still see quite a quite a few folks. No, no, no hmm. there's there's a lot of folks there's a lot of folks left. <laughs> okay, good because when I dialed in, it just said uh, only one attendee. Uh, when I called before, it said forty. So so the there was an issue with the number, uh, but that's okay. We were almost done with the questions, but they, there was many other questions, I guess. Um, so yeah, and what we could, what we can do too, is, you know, we we are, you know, we are, uh, we are, uh, you know, at the, at, hour, at the yeah. end of. So, but what we can do, I mean, if you're if you're willing, uh, we we have a tech forum. Uh, you know, if you'd like to answer, you know, if you'd like to uh, answer some of the other questions that we didn't have a chance to get to during the presentation here, the Q and A session. If mm -hmm. you if you're up if you're up for answering those, we can we can also then post those online on our on our tech forum. Uh, we have. Um, you know, so folks, so folks can get access to that. When after you dropped sure. off, I, I did let folks know that your your presentation will be, you know, both we we recorded your your actual uh, presentation and the briefing slides will get posted online to the uh, CSI site, and we'll also post it on our uh, we have a YouTube channel. We'll post that out there so folks fo so folks can access the presentation as yeah. well. So. And and the key is for people to reach out to me, right? So if they want to, if they have a program and they need to involve their federal employee, uh, if they are if they are a contractor, but uh, make sure they they can reach out to me by email, 
if they want to become a pathfinder, or, or talk to us about their psychops, and if they have questions, they can certainly do that as well. Okay, yeah, that's 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 great. You know, I've, I've had your I've had your slide up there with your uh, contact info, your email address on there, so folks can can uh, can reach out to you. And so I just want to uh, you know I, I do want to thank you for agreeing to. Uh, uh, give the presentation. It's a very, you know, I think it's a very critical, important topic. You know, the uh, software, uh, software, as you say, is, uh, you know, it's embedded in everything. It drives every every system. It governs every system. So, being able to cr create uh, correct software, efficient software, um, yeah, I, I think this is, I think this is one of the really key initiatives for the uh, for the government, and I and I, I thank you for your your service and your sharing your expertise with us. Oh, thank you. This is why I'm here. So please, um, you know, I know some people freak out about sending emails to SESs, but don't just send me an email. I'm the only SES with a French accent, anyway, so you can just send an email. It's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, you 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 heard Nicholas, so feel free to take him up on his offer. And uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Shalone, and thank you for everybody that attended today. And uh, we look forward to uh, having you join us at uh, our future future webinars here at CSIAC. Thank you very much, and have Thanks a good everyone. day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye.